Carl Sagan is possibly the best-known scientist in the world. He has performed groundbreaking work about the nature of other planets. He's won a Pulitzer Prize for his book about the origins of human intelligence. His books and TV series have educated millions and millions of people about the universe. Carl Sagan's latest book is called Pale Blue Dot, A Vision of the Human Future in Space. He joins me now in our studio to talk about humanity's place in the universe. Good morning, sir. Good morning. I feel very small <laughs> when I read well, your book. I feel <laughs> tiny. Well, uh, you are, and so am I, and uh, so are the rest of us. I mean, uh, uh, being big isn't the only uh, the only thing. We we are well. We we live on a very insignificant world among many, which circles a humdrum star, the sun which is one of 400 billion others that make up the Milky Way galaxy, which is one of 100 billion other galaxies that makes up the universe, which it is now beginning to look is one of uh, an enormous number, perhaps an infinite number of other closed-off universes. In that context, of course we're tiny. Do, you, do, you, do those numbers still have meaning for you? Do you oh, actually sure. know what 100 billion Well, means? I can't picture it in my head, but I have difficulty picturing in my head six. I mean, six objects all at once, close your eyes, see if you can see them all without sort of moving your, your mental eyes from one to another. But uh, what does it mean to, to know what 100 billion is? Uh, just to be able to calculate it, to know how that it's bigger than something and smaller than something. And um, Scientists do that all the time. So do uh, economists. So do people in balancing their pocketbook budgets. I, I don't think it's all that hard. Your book is a dramatic reminder of how tr of how human travel has accelerated in the last few decades, but you start with your family's own progress. Tell me a bit about your grandfather ferrying people across the, the, the river in Central Europe. My uh, mother's father, Leib Gruber, uh, grew up in a very poor family in uh, what was then the, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And the only job he could get was uh, being a beast of burden. He uh, he would uh, have people climb on his shoulders one one at a time, uh, and he would wade across the river uh, uh, in a shallow part and deposit them on the opposite bank. And that was his his occupation. Did he did he live long enough to understand the worlds that you were exploring in your work? No, he did not quite live to Sputnik. But there was one. Uh, one moment when I was age 13 and uh, he asked me uh, what it is I wanted to do when I grew up and I said an astronomer and uh, he didn't know what that meant. It had to be explained to him and after he understood he said yes, yes, very impatiently, but how will you make a living? Um, <laughs> and uh, that was in fact a very deep question. I had never thought about it as uh, a way to make a living. I just thought of it as a way to to fulfill a uh, a joy and I thought I'd have to have some quite other and very boring job in order to support myself and do astronomy weekends and uh, evenings. And it was one of the greatest moments of my life when my high school biology teacher told me there were people who were actually paid to do astronomy. If you could get him on the phone now and, and talk about, I mean, he lived through the age when we've gone from one satellite to exploration of the solar system, and, and, and you just had a moment or two to give him the news, what would it be? The most I guess I would say, uh, Grandpa, we've uh, we've explored almost all the large worlds in the solar system, and we've sent four ships to the stars. And he would look at me uncomprehendingly, and uh, argue, "But what's it good for?" I think that would be the quality of the of the discussion with Now, you have reservations yourself about what it's good for. It's, it's into, you're, you're, you're such a fair scholar that when later in the book you're examining the arguments for carrying on with this, you begin by, by presenting very convincing <laughs> arguments for not carrying on with it. Well, I, I, it's true. I, I do, uh, in the book, seem to be arguing with myself, um, and that's because I, I am arguing with myself. There are, there are arguments on both sides, and particularly... Many of the arguments that we've heard about uh, human spaceflight uh, are, are tendentious to, to spurious. I mean, we don't need it for science. Robots are much better and much cheaper and don't risk human lives. And the spin-off arguments uh, don't work. Uh, it's sort of like uh, 
give me $80 billion to send people to the moon and I'll throw in a free stickless frying pan. But we would have got it anyway, you say. The Teflon didn't come from... Oh, oh it, it, the, the argument is specious on several different grounds. Yeah. But uh, th that's just one of them. You know, if we're That was a little prop I thought it had, and you kicked it out. No, no Velcro, no, no, no Teflon. No, no, those, those arguments don't work. The, uh, you see, the robotic programs have uh, revolutionized our world in... in communications, in uh, military reconnaissance, treaty verification, meteorology, monitoring the health of the Earth, um, examining other planets and comparing them with ourselves, looking into the deepest questions of the origin and fate of the universe. All of that is done with robots comparatively cheaply. That is cost effective. What's not cost effective is the human program. It, so the original justification was in the context of the Cold War, beat the Russians, show our rockets are bigger mm. and better than their rockets, and so on. That obviously can't be the argument today. Today, the shuttle is used to uh, you know, ferry seven people up into low Earth orbit, uh, launch a communication satellite that could just as well have been launched by an uh, unmanned so-called um, booster, and then the tomato plant didn't grow, or the newts are doing very well, thank you. And then they come back down again. And then that's called exploration. That's not exploration. 250 miles is, I don't know, uh, certainly more than the distance from, from Toronto to the Maritime Provinces. If you drove a bus back and forth uh, 20 times, would you call that exploration? Um, it, what NASA should be doing with the human program in terms of uh, public garnering public support and preparing for the future is going to other worlds, true exploration. And there the argument is, um, there are many that I try to draw forth in Pale Blue Dot, but one of them has to do with uh, safety, the safety of our species, uh, in the sense that in the long term, I'm not talking about years, I'm not talking about decades, but in the long term we, uh, we are a danger to ourselves, you actually to ourselves. You actually say that it's a choice between spaceflight and extinction. This is a, a huge and overpowering argument. But you also, I mean, in a, there's no, no conversation this brief can do justice to the subtleties of the book. But, but there are, as, as humanity chooses options here, and it is a case of a finite number of dollars, even if it's hundreds of billions, can't we clean up our act here and, 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 and make it through? without having to flee to other worlds? Well, <coughs> we are a danger to ourselves. It's, there's no doubt about that um, because our technology has reached formidable, maybe even awesome proportions, and at the same time we live uh, and depend upon a very fragile environment. The thickness of the Earth's atmosphere compared to the size of the Earth is about the same as that of the coat of shellac on a big schoolroom globe mm. compared to the size of the globe. And here we are pouring all 